Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast, named one of the best commercial real estate podcasts by Business Insider. I'm your host, Steph Boldrini. We review all aspects of commercial real estate investing and bring the top people in the industry to share their best tips and lessons learned. And in today's episode, we are celebrating our 200th episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. We have this podcast going for over five years, and I am very grateful to have you as a listener. It has also been an honor to get to know so many of you personally, we have been ranking as the top 1% of podcasts globally for a while, thanks to you and all of our guests. As you guys know, 99% of our guests are here through invite only. I make sure to pick people that I think are very knowledgeable in their field of expertise and that they're not trying to sell you on anything. And I really hope that the lessons shared here either make you a lot of money or help you avoid a massive cost or mistake. And of course, we all make mistakes. We all learn on a daily basis. And even veterans in the industry still learn things every single day. It is impossible to know or predict every single aspect of a deal, even for veterans. So whatever you're going through, it's okay. Just try to find a solution. And in this episode, I will share some of the most recent learnings and observations. Some are in mindset and some are related to real estate investing. I'll start with real estate investing. Every single deal has multiple problems that you will have to overcome. A friend of mine that has been building multifamily projects in California for several years told me that for each problem you must block and tackle. And I have never heard anyone say that there was an easy deal, especially in development. In fact, they say if there was ever an easy deal, they all happened before I started my career. We were only left with the difficult ones. So it's in these moments that we feel better about all the problems that we're trying to solve ourselves on our deals. And I just want to pass this along to you because I know everybody's going through things right now. So for my first development, which I have been working on for one year, it has really been a roller coaster. One week we have decent news, another month we have no news, and then another week we have terrible news. It's very easy to want to give up during the terrible news weeks. It's very easy to think, I'm done. but. If we want to build anything, we cannot give up because there will always be a solution to your problems. You just need to find a way, talk to people and ask, ask questions and really do more work so you can find your answer. We have to come up with solutions or alternatives. For example, one piece of land that we had in contract, the feasibility report came back very bad for self-storage okay terrible news but what can we put there what would be the highest and best use for that piece of land after self-storage and this was not the worst piece of news that i received by the way just uh sharing because we haven't closed on the other development yet i have to talk to a lot of people in the industry not only peers but also brokers and and contractors and GCs and and the neighbors to see if we can come up with another suggestion that I may not know exists. Today's interest rate is a prime example. We are facing different challenges than when the rates were low. When the rates were low, our challenge was to find 
any opportunity that worked because the cap rates were so compressed. Investors were so excited. They were throwing money at deals. And now that the rates are high, we need to figure out a way to be creative on the lending side. For example, seller financing, which a few sellers are open to. Or if you are in development, you must be creative around, for example, keeping costs down. As a friend of mine recently shared with me, we must look for materials in China, for example. Moving on to the next bullet point of recent learnings. This one is going to go back to my beloved car washes. I had a lot of negative energy towards them because they were not doing well. And I did not want to learn how to operate a car wash. And so last year, at the end of the year, I was reading a book that told me to write down all of my problems and put them in a God box and stop worrying about them. So one of them <laughs> was the car wash. So I wrote car wash in a piece of paper and put it on my God box in December. And I decided to close them all in January and stop thinking about them. By April, April, four months later, one of the car washes was sold. We closed escrow in April. Another item on my God box also got fulfilled by April. And both of them literally happened out of thin air. I am not joking. So I learned to stop putting negative energy around something and just let it go. And another lesson that ties into this is that we should put our time into high return items versus low return items. For instance, I'm not looking at cash on cash anymore because if I had put in a, in a property, let's say 150K, for example, and I'm making 75 net, I am making 50% cash on cash, right? That's a phenomenal cash on cash. However, how much time am I spending managing that property? What is the cost of my time? Is it worth it? 75K based on the hours I have to manage that. My bottom line is these car washes were at some point barely breaking even. And it was a small expense relatively to everything else that I'm working on in the mortgage tax and everything else that I just decided to close them and come to terms that I'm just going to have that expense until something happens to these car washes, until I'm able to sell them or convert them. And something did happen, which was a real miracle from God. And so I learned in this entire car wash experience that high and low returns can be calculated in very different ways. So cash on cash for me, and my personal deals is not what I am thinking about, but the actual dollar amounts that I am making for the time that I'm spending on a deal is. So in that example of 150K investment that I'm making 50% cash on cash on my money, $75,000 a year, what is better? Should I spend that amount of hours in that project or in a larger deal that let's say may return $1 million that year. Should I put 200 hours on an item that is making me 75 K or in an item that will make me a million dollars? Another thing that I learned with this experience is that buying a portfolio of properties for a discount is a fantastic way to invest. You not only get a discount on all of them because you're buying in bulk, but you can turn them around and sell a couple of them individually for a higher price 
and keep the other properties potentially for free. As far as the car washes, I got three of them and the self-storage facility. I got a discount on everything because it was a portfolio and I also negotiated a price reduction. And today, three and a half years later, with the sale of that one car wash, I paid the entire mortgage for all three car washes and had some money left. I hope you guys really understand this because this also happened on another deal that we raised funds for two months ago where we bought 19 units in Dallas for a steep discount and we're going to be selling them individually. Those are 19 condos. We're going to be selling them individually for a higher price. So buying, look for portfolio properties. They are everywhere. They are in your city, in your area of focus. And let me know how it goes. Another thing that I have been working on is partnerships with people that know their field very well, but they don't have the cash to invest. For example, employees working at commercial real estate firms that are very good at what they do and they haven't thought about doing their own thing because they just cannot. Another example is incredibly driven individuals. Incredibly driven individuals, they will find the answer. If, you t if they don't know anything about, for example, finding land, they will go ahead and figure it out if they want to make money. So I don't discriminate on young people at all if they are incredibly driven for example, but they may not know all of the details of real estate investing. So to tie all of this together, for example, let's say you have five partners that are very capable. Each one of them are working on a deal that you are part of. Yes, your slice of the pie is smaller, but you now have five properties that you are working on with very capable people. And of course, regarding partnerships, I am very, very picky. I think you should spend a lot of time with this person. I think you should potentially travel with them because a lot of things go wrong when we travel and you can see how they react. You really must do a huge due diligence on them. Look for cues, uh, good or bad, and work on a small project at first do not make big commitments with them for for life for for a longer term especially in the first few projects see how they act and react to the hurdles that will inevitably come up watch out for their integrity when something happens what do they want to do with that and those are all the things that i do when i partner up with them and one thing that I have noticed with myself and multiple other people is that if somebody does something wrong in the partnership and they're unethical, they will do it again. Please listen to me because I have experienced it in different ways in, in a way of um, people disrespecting me. I know multiple people that they have given the benefit of the doubt after somebody did something wrong in the partnership and they did it again. And so these people will not change. So please, <laughs> fool me once, shame on them. Fool me twice, shame on me. Remember that. Moving on to mindset and the things that I have learned for my mindset in real estate investing. You may already know this phrase that they say readers are leaders and I cannot agree with it more. I try to observe what common traits highly successful people have and a lot of them did read a lot in their childhood. Some of them started reading in their adult years but what they have in common is that they all read a lot. So the reason that this makes sense to me is because when we read one book, no matter how amazing that book was, we really forget most of what we read. 
However, when we have reading as a regular thing in our lives, a lot of the messages of these books, they are very similar. They're just written in a different way. And so through that repetition is how that information begins to stay with you for the long run. And this can be in any subject, whether you're reading on self-improvement books or real estate books, the messages will stick with you because they're very similar across different books. That is why I believe that readers are leaders. Talking about books, if making money is part of your goals, read books written by billionaires. There are quite a few of them out there. When I read about the Irvine Company, it was such an incredible way to learn about some of the hurdles that they went through and how they overcame them that also put me in touch with people that actually worked there. And I feel like I'm just getting closer and closer to Donald Brent. <laughs> and one day I'm going to get to interview him somehow. Another billionaire book that I have recently read was Alan Sugar, What You See is What You Get. I learned so much with that book about tenacity, speed, and that everyone that is at the top has faced many, many, many challenges. It makes you feel better when you're going through your own challenges. You basically think, wow, Alan Sugar bought the sports team for fun and it was one of the worst investments he has ever made. <laughs> many other things have, have happened to that guy. People were bad-mouthing him in the media. It was a tough, tough life when you start to get to that level. And if you don't like reading a book, autobiographies are very easy to get through via audiobooks because they are stories. Put it on Spotify. Spotify actually, they are giving 15 hours of free audiobooks per month which is perfect, and it's a really good way to get through these billionaire biographies. Another trait that I have observed from some very successful people is that they have all experienced different extremes in their life. Whether they experienced poverty or lived in a country that had a lot of problems, or even people that were born with a silver spoon, but their parents made sure that in the summertime they would spend half of the time working at a farm doing hard labor and the other half they would spend at one of their parents' friends' companies doing an internship. They had that perspective of, okay, if I don't work hard, I'm going to be picking up cow things you know, from a farm. And they had that contrast in life. The common trait there was that they had seen the good life and the bad life. And that made them driven. And these people are also very curious people and they are very good listeners. Another thing on the mindset side, and I'm going to be very vulnerable on this one. Earlier this year, I realized that I was becoming very negative with everything that I was learning about what is happening to our country. And I was not sure if this is how it has always been and we just didn't know or is it really getting worse and worse. I have my personal opinions on that, but basically I decided to delete all social media apps from my phone and I can attest that I have been extremely, extremely happy since then. I still do check social media once in a while on my laptop, but none of the others and my life has been truly, truly wonderful. And the last thing I want to share with you guys about mindset is that one of my goals this year was to not spend time on things that would cost $250 or less. This I have learned from the book, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, A Guide to Wealth and Happiness. 
and also from The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And this goes back to my book, Readers Are Leaders, point, because I had to read The 4-Hour Workweek in order for me to really do this. this. I had to read the second book for this tip to stick with me, basically. Of course, it's not always perfect. Sometimes I am spending time on items that cost me $250 or less, but it's been ma it's m it has made me much more thoughtful of what i spend my time on does that really matter and could i have been spending that same amount of time on something that is going to have a much bigger return for me even if it is i'm going to lose 250 dollars or less can i put that same amount of time in something that is going to turn into thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars Again, it's not perfect all the time. My my interior designer just bought a two hundred dollar candle, and I really want to return that candle. Uh, but <laughs> I'm gonna hold myself on that one. Um, and so yeah, so besides the candle, it could have it could be anything else. It could be driving somewhere to return something that costs fifty dollars, or it could be spending time trying to find a cheaper hotel. Or it could be spending time with small items related to customer service. It could be any of these. And that is my 200th episode review of the most recent lessons learned. I hope this was useful to all of you. And please make some time to give us a review this is really important for our podcast and uh, we do put a lot of hours on this on a weekly basis. Thank you for being great, wonderful listeners. I really appreciate all of you and I will see you next time.